Lindsay, that was beautiful as usual. Wonderful song. I love that song. I love that song. And thank you, Gina. And um, from the Pledge Drive perspective, from my perspective as a co-senior minister, um, it's, it's vitally important that we have a way to plan your generous gifts. And my main message to you is from the bottom of my heart, I'm so deeply thankful for your generous giving. Through this time, I'm gonna talk a little bit about today. I'm calling it the COVID time. That's how I'm referring to this time, this once in a lifetime experience. So uh, um, uh, fill out your pledge card and uh, we love um, auto tithing because it lets us plan a little better and schedule a little better and everything like that. But what am I gonna talk about today? I'm gonna talk about the divine authority to choose. And this divine authority to choose is a gift that was given to you from the moment you came into this life experience. Because it's not this deity or this man in the sky with a white beard that sets rules and we don't follow them, bad things happen. It's not a roll of the dice. We have this power within us to make the choice. And when we make that choice, our life unfolds around us based on those choices. And so, John, could you put the first slide up? And so a man by the name of Gary Zukav wrote a fabulous book 25 years ago. It was called The Seed of the Soul. I don't know how long it was on the bestseller list. It, it, it really changed my life when I read it at the time. So he tells us this about choice. He says, choice is the engine of evolution. If you choose unconsciously, you will evolve unconsciously. You will, if you choose consciously, you will evolve consciously. The power of choice is the greatest gift you have been given, second only to the gift of life itself. And as I said, this power of choice is, starts the creative process from the teaching, because what happens, it creates your life experience. From the teaching of Jesus, it's, it is done unto you as you believe, um, Wayne Dyer would say, what you think about expands. And the founder of the Science of Mind philosophy, Ernest Holmes, would tell us, change your thinking and change your life. So it's a powerful thing to be, but for those of you who know me, you know I like to go back and relate it to very ancient teachings. And to me, that's the power of this great philosophy that Ernest Holmes put together for us. Because what he did is he went back through all the great spiritual traditions and faith traditions, and he believed that no one tradition had a lock on the truth. But if you listen to them all, you could weave this golden thread of truth, and it would make much more sense than the individual was. So, um, John, let me have the second slide, please. So this saying, fell from the, from the lips of the Buddha somewhere around the 500 years before the common era. It was recorded orally and then finally written down 100 years into the common era. And this is what he said. He said, all that we are is the result of what we have thought. It is founded on our thoughts. It is made up of our thoughts. That's from the Dharmapada, which is a sacred Buddhist scripture. So, but tell me, isn't that something that you would think you would hear in a um, Science of Mind Foundations class? We teach the same thing every day in our class. And um, my mom uh, gifted me with a uh, great book called Zen and the Art of Happiness. And uh, there's a story, she says, there's lots of stories you can use from the pulpit, and she's right. And I'm gonna share one of those teachings and one of those stories today. And what that story tells you to do, and remember this came from a Buddhist author and it's just like us. He says, take on the belief that we are the authors of our next moment. And he goes on to tell us, let's first think about what our consciousness is putting out there and how we're creating our world. And so, 
everyone knows that everything that happens to you is not the best possible thing that can happen to you, at least in one sense of the word. But um, you're asked the question, we all have a personal philosophy of life. And sometimes that philosophy has days it's this thing, and days it's that, that thing. So to be honest with ourselves, sometimes when we get to this group, we say, oh no, my philosophy is perfectly positive. That's what Ernest Holmes taught. And I think that all the time. Well, this minister will tell you that that's not true for me because we all have our days when we're focusing on different things. We all have our days when we're processing something that's coming up internally that we didn't even know where we came from. So do you have a philosophy that life is great and good things happen to me? And I know there's people in this conversation, in this congregation that I've seen that and they've lived for 40 and 50 years and they just um, interpret everything as good. And for the most part, they have a beautiful and joyful experience. Do you have a philosophy that unfortunately I'm unlucky and bad things happen to me? Or maybe you have a philosophy, you know, I'm doing my work, I'm doing my affirmations, I'm doing my spiritual practices, but unfortunately there's accidents that happen. And unfortunately unfairness just seems to be likely to me. Well, for me, all of these things, they're what I call self-fulfilling prophecy. And this story really sort of demonstrated that. Because what we have, and, um, one of the most powerful, I learned this from one of the most powerful ministers in our movement, Dr. Kathy Hearn, who was the Dean of our ministerial school. She would say fear and faith are extremely powerful motivators. They can create things in your life either way you choose. So if you're looking at fear, you're probably going to look at a bit of more of a constricted life. You're probably going to bring things into your life to be more fearful. And if you look at faith, you're probably going to be looking for compassion, for joy, and for love. And so what, what you turn to turns to you in the external world. Because it's not you looking out the external world and having to take what comes at you. Because the power and this divine authority to choose resides in us. It resides in me and it resides in you. And as you turn to it, it can make a difference. Because if something bad happens in your life and you act in a way that you're saying that, oh, this is just my life and I guess this is what I'm gonna deal with, you're seeding your future life for more of the same. A great Taoist philosopher, Wang Zhu, said this, the true person sees what the eye sees and does not add to it something that is not there. The person hears what the ears hear and does not detect imaginary undertones or overtones. The person is not busy with hidden meanings, which, which means that we don't have to put a story on how we interpret everything to us. One of the best Buddhist teachings that has really been personally meaningful to me is you have to get to a point where you see reality as it really is. It's passing, it's nothing more, it's nothing less. And just because there's a reality doesn't mean that you're a bad person. And just because there's a reality doesn't mean it's gonna recreate itself. And it tells a story in the book about a man named Max. So Max is probably about a person of my age and it was interesting. So Max was in a situation, um, I would say it's probably common to what we're in now, the, with the COVID experience, as I'm calling it, the economy's not thriving. But Max had this thriving sandwich shop, absolutely thriving. People were waiting in line. And Max was a generous man. He'd give away free pickles. He'd give away free potato chips. Now and then he'd give away free Cokes. And his sandwiches were known for being overstuffed. Well, that's probably not the best thing from a health perspective, but the uh, customers loved it. And that's why they were lining up to see him. And the economy was down. 
but his business was thriving. And then Max's son, who was a very educated man, Max worked hard to give him a good education. So he had several degrees and he had this um, philosophy or people looked at him at having a really good business head on his shoulders. And he was watching what Max was doing. And he was saying, dad, I hate to tell you this, but you're making a big mistake from giving away all your extras. Don't you know that the economy is in bad shape? Don't you know that people don't have money? And he says, I'm really concerned from you because if you continue doing this, you're going to be in the same shape. And so his son went back to the city he came from and Max thought about that. And Max actually started following his son's guidelines. So he stopped giving away all the extras and as time passed, the business declined. And he wrote, and he wrote his son back and he says, you know, you were right. Uh, the economy is bad. People don't have money. And my business is suffering because of that. And so those are two stories. So Max's story was he wasn't looking at the external conditions. He was just following, as we would say, the law of circulation. And he was generous. And as you give freely, it is given freely to you. But Max did one thing. He changed the story that he believed in. And his external circumstances changed exactly with him exactly with him. And so um, is it happenstance that it happened to him? Could be, but if we follow this Buddhist philosophy that we're the authors of our next moment, probably not. Probably not that, that, Max's, that Max's consciousness in the before created his prosperity. And so I want you to think back um, of something that you thought of at the time was really terrible. But I have another caveat for it. But this something in your own life experience, when time had passed, you realized it was powerful and it was really a great thing that happened. So can we all think of something like that? And for me, I'll share my personal story. For me, that was me coming to California. Because about 16 years ago, I was working for an engineering firm in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And um, I was always the one that did the crazy, would go chase the crazy jobs like um, taking sawdust and making diesel fuel from it. And we even used chicken litter, if you guys know what chicken litter is, and made energy and fuel from it and everything like that. So. I came here at the time, spent about three or four months in Riverside, working with the University of California Riverside at their technology. Unfortunately, I had to tell them it, their technology really didn't work because they made some mistakes. So I kept consulting, and so finally I transferred here. But California was a, was a um, strange place for me to be. I was raised in Texas and Louisiana. My wife at the time really wasn't fabulously thrilled about being in California. And Lord knows the price of houses in California was ridiculous. I'd never seen anything like that before. I had to pay for, I had um, several houses back in Louisiana that were rental properties and I had to pay more, much more than that just to get into a condo here. So it was pretty distressful for me. But let me tell you, I'll age myself as Paul Harvey would say, the other side of that story. The other side of that story is that story awakened my desire for my ministry. And I've shared this with you before, that I've had the calling to be a minister from the time I was eight years old. I think my times, big times were eight, 19, 30. And then finally in my early 50s, I went to ministerial school. So I went right next door to Reverend Dr. Peggy Price and um, I told her my story and she prayed with me first and then she brought me into the fold of this great place called Seal Beach Center for Spiritual Living. I became a practitioner, started teaching some classes and then realized 
this desire to become a minister was now coming to the forefront because I saw it had real potential. And two thirds of the way down to San Diego, there's this great town called Encinitas and there's this great ministerial school. So I started going to it and had the privilege of graduating with um, one of the great ministers in the movement. I mentioned her early, Reverend Dr. Kathy Hearn. And so if I wouldn't have, if I would have turned this opportunity to California down, none of this would have happened. And so what, um, what Wang Zhu wants you to do is he wants you to look at your experience as you're going through it with the possibility mindset. And for me, when I think of things that have happened that turned out really good, it allows me to do that. Ernest Holmes says, the moment you step out of the ordinary ranks, you are in the spotlight of evolution. Your own choices describe you and you are no longer thinking as others. Thank goodness you're no longer thinking as others because Ernest Holmes also said, paraphrase, if you keep thinking what you thought, you keep getting what you got. So when you can turn away, when we can turn away from this thinking of limitations. Once again, we can turn to our fear or we can turn to our faith. And that choice is what makes all the difference in our world. Another great New Thought author, Raymond Charles Barker says this, all intelligence abides in your subconscious mind and it just waits on you to call on that. At the center of your mind is the clear decision that you should make but what's yours to do is to go and find it. So we are in this space where we've had to um, change a lot of the way we do things with this COVID experience, as I've said before. Um, I never thought that, um, that we wouldn't have a place for six months where we could hug each other as we walk in the door, where we have our fellowship afterwards, where we're just so glad to see each other and express it physically, but we have. And so my challenge to you is, can you follow this Buddhist philosophy that you are the author of your very next moment? Can you look at that philosophy? And if you look at it, can you step up and own that philosophy and use that philosophy each and every day? because it's a powerful thing to, thing to be. And I know there's a lot of things that causes fear, but there's also a lot of things, especially our spiritual practice and our affirmations and our studying that causes faith. So my challenge to you is own that you are the author of your next moment, make use of it well, and live the life of your dreams. Thank you, God bless you.